Well, Lacey, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I actually met Lacey a couple of years ago. I was doing one of our auctions and was introduced from a mutual friend. And you volunteered. My buddy said, he said, you've got to meet this girl. Her name is Lacey. And she is a boss. She has this company. She's like the top hair extension woman in the world. And you've got to meet her. And you immediately donated a bunch of uh, amazing extensions to our cause. And we became friends ever since. So it's kind of a serendipitous working through charity, getting to know some amazing people. So pleasure to, to have, you know, met you that way. Yeah, thank you. Top in the world, wow. That's what he told that's me, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a, some high praise that you were getting. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit, I, one of the things that I love about your story is um, you currently, you're a single mom, you got a couple kids, um, and you've got this business that is just really thriving. And I kind of gotten to watch how you do that a little bit, and it's kind of fun for me to see when you're in work mode versus when I know you socially and we're just out hanging out and things like that. But I want to back it up a little bit because how did you become this boss entrepreneur woman? Were you always that way as a child? Or give us a little bit of insight how you were when you were younger. So it's actually funny. I've told this story a few times, but I've always, my mind always is on entrepreneur mode, I would say. I, I started a business when I was 12. A lot of my friends uh, used to babysit and I had two little brothers that I always had to babysit and so I didn't want to babysit to make money. So what I did was uh, I cleaned houses for, but I was very uh, selective whose houses I would clean. I only would clean houses of the old women in my neighborhood and church. So I would go, it would just be mainly dusting and vacuuming. So I made a little, um, gosh, it's so funny. It's like clip art from computers. It's gonna date us back to people don't even know what clip art is, but you remember. So I printed off clip art from my mom's computer and it said, um, it just said my services, I charged by the hour and I did it Saturday mornings for them. This is when you were so, like 12 or 13? Yeah. Oh wow, okay. So I started that business and I actually did that like through high school. So I would just clean women's houses, but they were women that, you know, widows or women that their houses really weren't that messy. And so I didn't have to babysit like everyone else my age was doing. So that was my business I had for like six years. Wow, so you were young. from the beginning, you were just getting after it a little bit. Yeah. I love that. I was asked to babysit one time and I hated it so bad. I just like fell asleep on the couch. I remember and woke up and the kids had like gotten into some popsicles and they were all over the couch and the furniture. And I was like, this is not for me. Well, so. I'm pretty sure the parents didn't want you back anyways. Yeah, no, <laughs> after that, that so you were my one foray into that. I'm good at like very small intervals with children, you know, like <laughs> give them to me for an hour. As soon as they start yelling or crying, they're yours back. So, um, well, very cool. That's a, that's pretty awesome. And so did you kind of always have an inkling that you were going to go into? Because I know I've we've talked a little bit before. Um, you kind of got a lot of negative feedback when you s decided to go the route of hair school and going into hair. Yeah, I did actually. And especially, I, I started hair school 17 years ago. So, oh my gosh, yeah. So, I actually wanted to be an attorney. And I had already started my college, while I was still in high school, I'd already started taking college classes. Mm -hmm. And I did very well in school and a lot of my family members and a few friends were, you know, it was a route to go to hair school was kind of a sellout at the time. Um, and it, people were teasing me about it. Yeah. You're like a beauty school dropout they were calling you and all that Yeah, stuff. exactly. So, you know, why go finish your degree and then do hair school and it was, you know, kind of a negative thing. So, so what was the ultimate deciding factor for you? Cause like that's, that's hard to do when you're 17 years old to make that decision to do something that a lot of people maybe frown upon or look down on compared to, you know, going to law school. Yeah. So initially I, I thought it would be a great, I was awarded a scholarship for hair school, um, through a pageant I had done when I was 17. And I thought it'd be a great way to uh, make money while I was in school to have a hair license and cosmetology school is only a year so I just wanted to go for a year and then go back to school but when I started hair school I loved it so much that I I was like no this is what I want to do I loved it yeah I kind of had a similar thing with real estate I was just doing it because I didn't apply to go to BYU in time and so I had six months with nothing to do but I jumped in and started making this money I really enjoyed it and you know decided to go that route instead so sometimes I guess that happens but well and so 
I mean, when did you, I know you caught your first big break, you got a job. This was back in early 2000s in Vegas where Bellagio was the biggest casino in town. How did you get the gig working at Bellagio and tell us how that experience kind of shaped what you ended up doing? So I was actually living in Salt Lake. I'd lived here for um, about eight months or so and I was assisting and working in a salon up in Salt Lake, which I loved. But I um, wanted to do something more. I always wanted to be in Vegas or Los Angeles. So I was visiting my family in Las Vegas and just went and applied at the Bellagio. I was like, oh, that'd be cool. I wasn't sure I would get the job, but I did. And so I moved to Vegas and started as an assistant uh, doing hair, so assisting all the other stylists. Um, and I was 19 and I took that job and just, I loved when you it. Met, you got to meet some amazing people there, right? Yeah. Who are your favorite, like who are the coolest people in your mind that you got to meet and do hair on? Gosh, well, well it's so crazy because I, I've met so many people from all ends of the spectrum. And it's funny, all the people that were popular in the early 2000s, like Paris Hilton, Paula Abdul, those kinds of people I was able to meet and do their hair. Um, as well as, you know, a lot of people come in the salon even if I wasn't doing their hair. So it was just Las Vegas and um, Bellagio was like the premier, like you said, it was the only hotel really on the strip um, in the early 2000s. Uh, but I would say my coolest experience, two coolest, two coolest experience was when I met Kenny Chesney and then I used to do uh, Muhammad Ali's hair oh, wow. as well. So, I mean, that was really cool. That's legit. Yeah. I mean, I would say probably Muhammad Ali is the coolest. I mean, legend, obviously. That's like what makes you so cool, though, as a person. Because, like, most women would be, you know, let's say Paris Hilton and Paul Abdul. You're like, no, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I, like, that was the coolest thing. He, it, it's funny. So, he obviously, um, you know, with his disease. Right. He couldn't really talk. So, he would have... Um, he would have me like come close, so he would like be like this, come close, and he did the. Um, he had me come close, and so I like he was gonna like whisper something, so I came close, and he went like this on his cheek, touch his cheek, so I would kiss his cheek when he was leaving. So I went and kissed his chick, cheek, and he did the whole turn thing, <laughs> like I was like, oh, you little stud. But anyways, it was funny. So. So I mean, when everyone's like, oh, did, what celebrity have you kissed? I'm like, well, I mean, Muhammad Ali kind of kissed me, so that's yeah, all. I, I, would, I would say that's a pretty uh, pretty good go-to. <laughs> I mean, it was super funny that he did that little, like, trick. Oh, well, I think I used that once in, like, when I was a junior in high school or something. It works, you know, it's good. Well, I, I <laughs> mean, it worked for him, so whatever. That's fantastic. Um, well, and so you're at the Bellagio. How long were you there for? And then how did you decide to go? Because you now, I mean, your company, Lace Hair Extension, how many employees do you have right now? We have eight now. Eight now. And your store is here in South Jordan. But you also, I mean, you do the extensions for people all over the world. I mean, you fly all over different cities and countries and things like that. And so you've built this thing pretty big. Um, how did you go from working at the Bellagio? How did you decide to go on your own? Give us that history. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I loved, I loved my experience there. I think it taught me a lot um, and taught me how to love hair extensions as well. But um, when Bellagio, uh, they, they grew a sister company, Aria, City Center. So I actually was the extension director over at Aria for a year. And that's where I first started my company. I used to travel all over, uh, I still do, but I would travel all over and do people's hair, like from New York to LA, uh, just everywhere. So I really wanted hair for my own use, hair extensions, so I thought, that I would start my own company. I thought it'd be super easy. So really it was just for my own use. And then a lot of my friends liked, liked it, like the colors I created, like the quality of hair we had. Uh, a lot of my friends in the hairstylist world, I should say. And so from there, people just started buying from me. And then uh, the reason I, I left Bellagio is because my ex-husband went to law school. So we actually moved to Michigan. And then I just kept my business growing from there. But it got a slow start, obviously. Uh, we moved to Michigan and I was pregnant and already had a two-year-old so I was doing the mom slash law school stay-at-home thing so my business was growing but very slow but that same you know the, those few years Instagram happened yeah I was gonna say I, you were one of the first early adapters using Instagram for business yeah I remember it's funny one of my uh, closest friends Susan Peterson uh, the CEO freshly picked super amazing successful 
woman, she, I remember her on Instagram. She followed me on Instagram and I remember looking and I was like, oh my gosh, this girl just followed me back on Instagram and she makes baby moccasins for like the Kardashians. And I remember she had like 450 Instagram followers and I just thought it was so cool that she followed me back because I think I had like 12. But yeah, I've been using Instagram forever and I would say that, uh, I mean, marketing's definitely changed, but I would attribute a lot of my success in the marketing world to Instagram. Well, you had a lot of the celebrities and thing, people that you did hair on would tag you in their photos, right? I yeah. remember seeing, I think Mariah Carey tagged your photo that I saw. Or... Yeah, we, and, and, and that's recently we've had Mariah Carey and I have relationships with a lot of celebrity hairstylists throughout the country and so that's how uh, so did you go out, here's one of the things I want the listeners to understand, because I know how you hustle to make this all happen, but I think people think it just, oh, it happened, she was using Instagram. So describe to us what you were doing on a weekly, monthly basis to get all these relationships and to build uh, that center of people that, you know, these celebrity stylists and all that. Yeah, so I was a celebrity stylist before I started my company, and I, I was able to stay friends with a lot of um, a lot of the stylists in the room, but so I was hustling at night, <laughs> emailing people and um, sending out samples for people to try, and then I was still doing hair during the day and also being like a stay-at-home mom, if you can even call a stay-at-home mom, because I was working at home with like crazy kids running around. Um, so I just worked more than forty hours a week. I mean, I worked. I don't even. I, like double like double what the normal person would work um, and I I definitely you know I I did things where I would keep growing my business when I had a good month I I saved the money and put it back into the business I didn't go out and buy a new car or go out and buy a new house or you know I've had this business for eight years and I finally bought a house this year you know so it's like I definitely as we kept growing, I would want to make sure and um, put it back into the business and keep investing in the business. So how did you find the discipline to do that? Because I think for a lot of you know, stay-at-home moms, it's such a job in and of itself just to do that, to have the discipline to then work on your business on that free time or that extra time that you were putting in. Uh, was because you didn't, I mean, you had a husband you assumed was just going to be going to law school and you, you know, you would be financially in a good position. What was your motivation to keep pushing and doing all that? To be honest, even though I had a husband that I knew would go to law school, um, I think it comes back down to how I was raised. Um, my, I learned to not rely on only one income. My, my dad passed away when I was five and I saw my mom uh, being a working single mother and so in the back of my mind I always and I'm glad I have that I um in the back of my mind I always was like well what if yeah you so I have before, that mentality right? so I always wanted to make sure that we had something to fall back on well I think that's the lesson that you've told me that before and that was what I was kind of hinting at was you know the I think the idea of making sure that you're finding something that gives you that security and, and that you didn't just kind of rely on because I mean you did go out to Michigan and you know you were supporting your husband and what he was wanting to do but at the same time you built this side business that's turned into this empire thingy that you have now. Yeah and I mean that was I didn't really ever think that it would grow into what it was like I said I just really wanted it for my own use and for my um, and for my clients and then it kept growing and you know, I'd say like four years ago as we grew and some of our posts that I had done with other bloggers went viral and people started emailing me from Virginia and Florida just randomly because they saw me on a blog. I was like, oh, this could be something. Let's see what happens. So I just kept, you know, I just kept working at it and growing. And So what's the hardest part of, um, I, we've talked about this a little bit before, but what's the hardest part of owning an actual location as opposed to just doing it yourself and flying out to these different people? You have a location with employees and everything now. What's the hardest shift that you had to make from going from just doing it on your own to actually running a full business? So with starting the salon, um, salon and storefront that we started, uh, it's been about a year and a half. And... Uh, I didn't realize how much work it would be to have so many more employees that were doing hair. 
So essentially I have two businesses now. I have the laced business that we ship hair all over and I'm trying to, you know, plan events and travel and promote that business. And then I have the local salon side. So having those two businesses, I didn't realize how separate they need to be. Um, and I built this 1200 square foot salon slash storefront and in the back is our warehouse. And within six months, we already grew out of it. So I actually just uh, signed another lease on a commercial warehouse space that we will put our headquarters uh, in there now. So I'll still have the salon and storefront where people can come in and buy hair and get their hair done. And then other hairstylists come in and buy it locally. And then we'll have our headquarters in a, uh, in a different location. So I would say that was, it was really hard um, running a salon and the business, trying to separate the two. So that just happened. That's awesome. <laughs> well, no, that's great that you're expanding and everything. Do, do you kind of look at yourself as a mentor to these younger you know, women that come in to work for you? Because you had some mentors, I'm sure, when you started. You were only 19 years old. And what's that experience of mentorship been like for you? Yeah, so that is, um, I kind of consider them like these little sisters of mine, which can be good and bad because they get very close with them and then have to be the boss and it can, that can be very difficult. Uh, but honestly, um, I just want them to be successful. I was really successful in the hair world when I was a hairstylist and I think, I think it's gotten a lot better, but like we first started talking about, sometimes people see hairstylists as you know, not a great career or because they can make it in college so they go to hair school and I have seen so many incredible successful hairstylists that do have college degrees but that love helping people and that do really well uh, in an environment that's hands-on so I just I really want to see them be successful and we're really lucky that I've created a platform where people call because they want to get laced hair extensions and so I have a great team there in the salon where I've trained all of them personally so they can do hair like like I can. Because I can't, I don't really have time to do hair anymore, unfortunately. Well, I was gonna say, what, what, do you, what do you do with your free time? What do you find time to do? Because I mean, you're, you are a busy person, obviously. I know, I know, you know, we've had an opportunity, what was that, a year and a half ago, we went out to the Patriots Steelers uh, AFC Championship game. That was always, that was a good time. But what, when do you find free time to go and do things for yourself? Or what do you like to do when you find that time? Uh, that's super funny because it's like, when do you find free time? Um, honestly, it, it's so, it, people that follow me on Instagram will see that I'm always traveling somewhere. Um, I'm such a workaholic that if I am home, that's why I can't work from home because I will just start cleaning or start doing something else. And so the only time I can escape is to travel. And that's why I love to travel so much. You'll probably feel the same way. If you're home, you're going to work. You're yeah. not going to have free time to go do anything. So my travel is what I do in my free time. And it's not really free time, but, and a lot of times it's nice because I can, you know, I can pop into a salon or make it a work trip or something. I still work while I'm on them, but free time is, is my travel time. Well, that's what I kind of tell people is, you know, nowadays it's 2018. If you plan accordingly and you set your schedule up the right way, you can work while you're traveling, but I do enjoy, I enjoy the time on planes when I'm disconnected. I purposely don't, you know, get the Wi-Fi on the plane and I get some time to myself to just do things, go over my, my, my business plans and read and just chill out and do nothing. Cause that is my kind of one place nobody can get me is when I'm on a plane, you know? And I, I have to be very honest. If I sit next to somebody that's a talker, I, I'll just tell them like, Hey, just being honest with you, man, I'm just going to kind of need some space to myself there on this flight. And sometimes I want to talk to him, but usually I'll just be very upfront because that is my one time when I get that space to myself and I enjoy traveling for that reason. Yeah, no, I'm the exact same way. There's times I will buy the Wi-Fi so I can catch up on text messages or emails uh, because I never have time during the day to mm. do that. So I, I'm the same way of flight. Even when I drive somewhere and I listen to music or an audiobook or something in my car, because I'm, I have to sit there and I'm stuck. I'm stuck on a plane or in a car and I can't do anything. And that's like, I, I don't know, I guess that's kind of funny that that's my unwind, unwind time, but I don't mind travel. When people are like, oh, doesn't it drive you crazy? You were at the airport and 
you know, if I have my flights delayed, I'm actually sometimes like happy about it. I'm like, yeah. well, I'm just stuck here for a few more hours and I can get some work done. What, what kind of stuff do you like to go do when you travel? What do you, what kind of traveling do you like to do? Oh geez. I, I mean, I, I kind of like it all. I don't have a, uh, I obviously love a beach vacation and all of that, but I feel like I've done that uh, this year. It's crazy. I've kind of done a, a lot of traveling this year, but I've been to, um, I go to China and I do that. I did that for work, but we were able to do throw in some fun. The times I've been to China, it was very like work and not nothing else, but I did the great wall and saw a lot of sites. Um, I was also in Bali this year. I did Canada and the East Coast, like Quebec City. Um, geez, where else have I been? Kind of in Mexico, of course, for like a quick weekend. I think the, um, my travel though, I don't usually plan it. It's kind of like a last minute, just like you were saying, uh, when we just like, we're like, hey, you like the Steelers, I like the Patriots, let's go. And we like plan it like the next day. I think that in our day and age with like, the hotel deals and you know points on your airlines and stuff like I feel like we can travel so easy now like travel so easy and I think a lot of people just don't realize how easy it can be so when did you know that you had made it as far as your business was going because I know in the beginning tell us a couple of those struggles you had in that moment where you're like okay this is gonna work yeah so that's kind of interesting because so many other things happened like in the mix of that, you know, I was going through a divorce and um, deciding what I should do and going through a divorce and becoming a single mom. Um, I wouldn't say I had like a, oh, I made it moment. I just had a moment where I didn't have a choice but to make it. Um, I knew I would be having to support my kids and I have sole physical custody of them. So I have them, you know, pretty much 85% of the time. And so I just, like I said, I didn't really have a choice but to make this work. And so I can't say one way or the other what would have happened had I not gotten divorced or, you know, things happen in life, you know, like they're going to, I guess. But honestly, you know, we talk about when I, uh, when I talk, speak at events or motivational speaking, we talk about our why. And my why was, you know, those two little boys that, um, I needed to support so I didn't have a choice and I did see it growing and um, and I knew with a you know not a little bit of hard work but a lot of hard work I could keep it going I um, didn't really have any financial backing I because of my divorce and I had short sold a house and I had gone through a few other trials I didn't really have very you know I didn't really have great credit so I couldn't really get financial backing for the business I didn't have you know, family members to give me money or anything. So really I had to be very careful with growing the business to, you know, like I said, I just kept putting more money back into it. So has your why, obviously with your kids being your big why, has that evolved over time? Um, what are some of the other things that motivate you? Because a lot of people, I think, you know, everybody who has children, I'm sure their why has to do with those children, but you've done so much extra and above. Is there other things um, that are part of your why or that motivate you as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, women, ha women with confidence, and being a woman entrepreneur in this day and age, I is very motivating for me. I have women that send me emails that just, you know, young girls or older girls or it, it doesn't matter their age that just say, "Hey, thank you so much for giving me confidence again. I got hair extensions and I just feel beautiful." And it could be a woman that was maybe suffering hair loss for whatever reason, as from cancer or to even just stress, mm -hmm. you know? Or a girl that just has thin hair that it could never grow, her hair could never grow. So honestly, um, that's also why I do what I do. I really love, um, I really love making women feel confident and making them feel beautiful. Right. And that is the very first time a woman sat in my chair and cried because I, did her hair. I think it was when I was in hair school. I gave her a haircut and color and she was, loved it so much she started crying because she just felt so beautiful and confident. So I'm really lucky that I'm in the business to obviously we've been very successful and I feel really, you know, really happy about that. But also people, you know, these women, their confidence is really incredible. 
But I think that's probably one of those big motivators when you see an immediate response of somebody that uses your product or your service and immediately has that reward of watching how it affects them. What a powerful thing to be able to be a part of, I guess, right? Yeah, and I, I do. I just think that women, when women feel confident, I mean, they really, it's cheesy as it may sound, they really can take on the world. Um, and it's not even about, you know, so many people are like, oh, the beauty industry is so vain. I mean, it could be considered vain. Everything, you know, I believe that there's a point that people go overboard with being vain, but I also don't think there's anything wrong with feeling beautiful and confident. And women, their hair is like their security blanket. And, you know, as, as your hair, as you get older, uh, your hair starts to thin out. And I'm just, I love that we can still make women feel confident and beautiful with their hair. It doesn't have to be super long. It just, but even just like a little bit of thickness makes them super happy. So. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've witnessed, I have a buddy that's a plastic surgeon. He helps sponsor this show, my buddy Nick. And one of the things that, you know, people are like, oh, that's kind of vain plastic surgery. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, I've had these conversations with women over and over again where something happens in their life. Either a guy dumps them or their husband cheats on them or something. And it's crazy how much they think it has to do with their physical appearance, but they lose this confidence. And so when you see them get it back, like I was engaged um, 10 years ago, right? And um, she had been married and he would cheated on her and she thought that he cheated on her because she had small boobs and uh, she wanted a boob job really bad, you know, breast augmentation, whatever you call it, but she just wanted to feel beautiful again and I felt horrible for it because it was like, this was her complex. This literally like caused her to lose all confidence in everything else that she did and so uh, we ended up not working out, but I let her keep the ring and I told her, I said, look, pay off the debt that you have from him and go get your boob job because mm -hmm. I just felt so terrible that I wasn't going to go through with it. But at the same time, she was a sweetheart. She did nothing wrong. It just wasn't right for us. But, um, and I heard she did and hopefully, you know, so, but my point is, is like, it is okay to, if you have confidence issues for whatever reason, if your hair's thinning or if you, you know, you feel like maybe you're a little, um, something part of you, you know, you just hate it. If you hate something every day, it's like I tell people when they're buying houses, I say, there's something, a part of the house that you're always going to hate. Don't buy the house. Or if it's something you can change, then great, buy the house and you can change it later. I think it's the same kind of thing. If you can change something that's going to give you more confidence and make you feel better, then why not? And I think hair extensions to me is very similar along the same lines. Yeah. And I, it's not only the confidence, but it's also the accessibility and how quickly you can do it. So it's like that instant gratification that just, you know, so many people, uh, like they're thinking, oh my gosh, should I cut my hair? Should I? And they really stew on it and it kind of makes them crazy. I've seen clients over the last, like I said, I've been doing this for 17 years. So really thinking about it forever. Should I change my hair? What should I do? And it's like, also it's just hair. I think that, uh, and I'm grateful that I think that I've been, you know, one of, like on the front end of changing, changing hair of how it really can just be an accessory. It's like, you know, you can, yes, it can be expensive, but it's like, who cares if you can just, cut it and then don't get extensions. You know, it's like, just shows you how easy you can change up your look and it's super fun too. So it can be fun, you know, along with feeling great about yourself. And like I said, if you see my Instagram, one picture, I'll have my hair really short. And then right now my hair is like 22 inches long. So it's just, for me, it's just kind of fun to change it up when I'm, you yeah, know. It's like moving your furniture around in your house or yeah. something, right? You just can mix it up a little bit. Yeah, I like right. that. When you've had a chance to do, I mean, what makes, your hair extension is so much different than some of the other ones that are out there because you've done the Victoria's Secret um, fashion show. I know that you go out, you go out and do that every year. Uh, we didn't do it last year, but I was able to do it two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember that was how I originally, when I was introduced, he's like, dude, this girl does the Victoria <laughs> uh, Secret fashion show. She's the boss. She's, she's the one that does all the best extensions that are out there. So what makes your extensions so much better? Like what do you do differently? And, How's that kind of helped you guys to grow your, your business? Uh, so to be honest, there are so many great extension companies out there and there's a lot of girls that have hairstylists. I was the first hairstylist um, that I know of anyways, like one of the first to actually start a line. So a lot of, um, and I've met with a lot of 
people that do own other competing companies just to talk to them and a lot of them are just guys that have MBAs because they saw a market that was lucrative and they grew the business but they don't they don't know anything about hair or anything about extensions they've had to learn now so I'd say that's kind of what sets us apart is that I am a hairstylist I had been doing it for 17 years and so I created I saw a lack as far as different colors and different techniques and different uh, methods of extensions that weren't available so for me I created these custom colors these ombre colors and these blends and mixes to make it look more natural and no one else had done that yet so eight years ago I was the first person that had like ombre colors which is why you know I'll explain it you probably know what ombre is but it's like where the hair is dark on top and it goes like sure yeah, yeah, yeah. so I was one of the first ones to have that okay. and again Instagram and the internet wasn't as big so there was probably other people that had it but in the market that I was familiar with no one had that yet so that was kind of what set us apart um, and just to be a business a business owned by a hairstylist I think makes us different because I listen to stylists and stylists you know that are my friends and they'll say hey you need to create you know this method or this color and so I'll be like okay well, let's do it so I think to just be you know, have that willingness, stylist, yeah. willingness to adapt and to, to actually like think outside the box a little bit, I think is always, seems like it's always helped you. Yeah. And so, um, and then we're just always changing and we create new colors and new methods and we just try to, I just try to kind of stay ahead of the curve if I can. Yeah. So well, I think it's in my business, a lot of times people, it's not very hard to get your real estate license as an example. And so people get in and they quit learning, they quit growing, right? That was, you know, when I was like at the peak of my career, I went and got my master's from Arizona State in real estate development because I wanted to stay ahead. I wanted to know more. I wanted to be able to give my clients that extra uh, knowledge, I guess you could say, and just stay on top of that. I think that's one of the things that people quit doing. And so I think people see a, a business like Hair Extensions, they probably don't understand just how much it is evolving and evolves. And when you're on the forefront of that, I guess that's how you can stay top of game. Yeah, and I had um, I actually had a friend ask me this last week. He just said, "Do you see extensions kind of like capping out and going anywhere?" And obviously, you know, anyone that owns a business wants to say, "No, that'll never happen." Um, but just from my knowledge, the last seventeen years of being of doing hair, I really don't think that they're going to go anywhere. I think that uh, styles change. Maybe people won't want it as long. Maybe they'll want it shorter. But there's always going to want. There's always going to be someone that wants it really long or really short. Mm -hmm. And no matter what length is in style, um, hair that's full is always going to be in style. For sure. No one wants their hair to be thin. And I mean, that's it goes all the way back to like Cleopatra with her wigs. And I, I mean men and women alike have always worn wigs or suffer you know suffering from hair loss have always wanted to have hair so i don't think that it's going anywhere yeah no i would agree i think it's one of those even in down economies people spend money on dentists and they're looking everything else right well what what an example you're able to be for your two young boys um what would you want them to say about you if they were describing you to maybe their friends like this is my mom what would you want them to say about you um Oh my gosh. Uh, honestly, I I love um, I love that they can know that it's okay for women to be hard workers. Uh, I think in our society, especially in Utah, that um, not that being a stay-at-home mom isn't hard work because I've done that and it's a lot of work actually. Um, but just that they can know that it's okay for women to also be bosses and to um, respect women in the workforce. I think that that is a huge part of this day and age. And um, it's funny because my boys actually, like I've done like little TV spots or something, and um, I have heard them when I go into their school to be like, my mom's been on TV. And um, not that, like, I don't mean that in a bragging way, but I just love that I know that they're proud of me for my hard work, even though they don't really tell me that. when. I can hear it that they'll say, oh, she's been in magazines or on TV, and that makes me proud um, as you know, business owner, but also as a mother and a woman, that they can see 
that um, women in the workforce and hardworking women. Absolutely. So. Well, do, do you feel a little bit of a, a not a pressure, but maybe a mantle that you are one of the you know you are one of the um, a very highly successful woman here in Utah in the workplace where it is a little bit you know culturally um, not as um, common as it is in other maybe bigger cities and things like that. There's a lot of reasons for that, but do you feel a little bit of a mantle that you carry to help kind of inspire other younger women, um, young girls to, to go into the workplace and be bosses and, and do those things, open their own businesses? Yeah, I actually, I get a lot of messages and emails from younger girls or even older than me um, that just say the same thing, like, oh, thank you for being so real and sharing your story and inspiring me to to want to work hard mm -hmm. and so um yeah i feel i don't know if responsibility is the right word but i want to you know not only for my kids but for you know those small little group that does follow me and that i inspire even if it's only three people you know those three people that i can help change their life and make them want to work hard is is actually helps me more than it probably helps them you know so it's really inspiring when I get a message like that from a woman that just says, wow, thank you, you know, I, I get a ton from women that are single moms that just say, you know, you're so inspiring and, you know, I can, seeing your story helps me know that I, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And that is really inspiring for me too. Well, and so what, what advice would you have? Let's say there's, you know, a young lady in college listening to this right now and she's thinking about starting her own business. Um, what advice would you give to that young woman? So honestly, um, like I said, I I just really worked hard. Like I didn't give up. I didn't. Um, I had a goal and I had a dream and a vision. And although things were hard, because they were really hard. Um, Did you ever almost give up? I actually never almost gave up on my business. I knew. I I didn't know. Um, I didn't know how successful it would be per se, but I knew that um, I started it and I invested whatever money I had, you know, at the time that I didn't want to give up. Um, but just, you know, th that it's okay that things don't happen. I think so many people see my life now and think, you know, they don't hear that it took eight years to get where it is. So it did. I started it eight years ago, almost exactly eight years ago. And well, when you had eight years of doing hair and I mean, exactly long so hours. I was, yeah so I worked my business didn't give me a paycheck until about a year ago so how I made money was I still had to do hair doing hair was what made me money running lace hair extensions didn't make me any so just to stay at it and the, the work of an entrepreneur um, though we get to you know take trips and do things isn't necessarily um, how easy people think it will be so even if you're you know and just do what you can. I always say do what you can with what you have. Um, so if you, you know, only have three hours a week to, you know, put on your business, do those three hours and just make sure you're focusing some time on it and um, just to know that it takes time and to be patient. I think that uh, obviously some businesses don't work out and I don't have the recipe for every business, but I, uh, I know mine works because I don't stop. And so, um, Yep. Even competitors that like, you know, get on my tail and maybe have surpassed me, I don't know. Um, they maybe surpassed me in some ways, but like I keep going because I don't jump off that treadmill, you know. So unless I stop, um, there's no way that anyone could really beat me completely because I won't ever stop. Yeah. So I love that. That's kind of a, a mantra in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. I love it. Well, you're an inspiration. I'm so excited to share this with our audience. You've um, been awesome. I tell people about your story all the time and share that. So thank you and um, look forward to many more good times. Yeah, thank you for having me. Alrighty. Thanks, Lacey.